Hello. All right. Welcome, everyone, to our next session. So our next speaker is Emily Dunham, and she will introduce herself. Um, oh, hello. Please make a seat. Welcome. Yeah, we've got lots of people. I think it's about the walking time from the main foyer after the bell just rang. All right. So please make her welcome. <laughs> Okay, hi there and welcome. Um, just out of curiosity, how many of you are here because you kind of wish there was a Rust talk where you'd learn Rust? A few, oh, that's like most of the audience. How many of you are here because you just want to know about the community side and couldn't care less what language it is? That's like a third of the audience. So I'm going to try to cater to everybody. So yeah, we know, we know how that will end. So. Um, to start off with, these slides are online right there. Um, you can send me emails and you can tweet at me if you so desire. I'll put that link up again at the very end. So I um, am fortunate enough that by profession I am a DevOps engineer for Mozilla Research, which means a lot of my time is spent working on the infrastructure for the Rust project. This has given me the opportunity to talk to the, um, the core team people and really learn from them about how they're doing this community. So um, before that, I worked at the OSU Open Source Lab, interfaced both as a member and as tech support for all kinds of different open source projects. And so I got all of these preconceived notions about how open source projects were supposed to work. And then Rust really shattered some of them in a good way. So the Rust programming language um, is a relatively new language. It is a systems language that um, is often compared against Go. Um, it is compared against C and C++ and people from web development backgrounds as well as from regular systems programming backgrounds use it to give them more control over their machines. So the language was started in about 2010, although it hit 1.0 on May 15th, 2015. So it's coming up on a year old um, of really stable rest. And since then, we've rolled a stable minor version every six weeks. So 1.6 just came out on January 21st. The goal of Rust is to create a language that is safe, concurrent, and fast. That little guy in the corner, his name is Ferris. He is a Rustation. He's the mascot of the project, and he might show up um, in future slides. So it turns out that when you shoot for all of these points at the same time, you get a very interesting language as a result. Um, there's much more than 40 minutes of content just on the language, but a couple of things that I think are useful for new people coming into Rust to understand about it. First off, it takes away your foot guns. This means if you imagine that there's a space of all of the valid programs that can be written in any language that do things that aren't terrible, um, most compilers, most interpreters will happily let you run code that's wildly outside of that space. Um, and Rust, on, on the other hand, is focused on staying within the set of all valid programs, which means there's sometimes a little bit of room, a little bit of valid programs that the compiler won't quite accept. In those cases, you can overwrite it using unsafe but it has mostly taken away the foot guns or at least marked them very clearly. Um, the cost, though, of this um, performance is that there's a bit of a learning curve. Now, the next slide is going to be the only time I show you any Rust code because I'm going to tell you why not to be afraid of it. Um, Rust will introduce a whole pile of new concepts. Some of the earliest that you will run into are ownership along with borrowing, so loaning the ownership of something to someone else, and lifetimes. So when something is no longer owned, it goes away. Um, these by themselves prevent you from ever, let the compiler prevent you from ever using, accessing memory after you've freed it. Um, this memory safety makes concurrency vastly easier. And this code is up here because annotated input and delayed input do exactly the same thing. Annotated input is um, you've explicitly stated all of this lifetime information about, the, uh, about what you're passing it. And that looks scary, looks um, intimidating. Allied input is identical. The compiler figures it out, and so they function identically. The compiler will tell you when it needs you to give extra uh, annotations and information by giving you a little error. And so it'll help you out. I actually think of the compiler as being like an automated mentor for you. Um, you'll try to write a piece of code, and it'll say, no, that's not a good idea. You can't do that. Just like pair programming with a really experienced C or C++ um, programmer will do for you. 
So if you want to get Rust, um, I personally would recommend if you want to use multiple versions that you use the multi-Rust tool rather than trying to man uh, manage them manually. And if you just want to run some Rust code, it'll execute in the play.rustlang.org sandbox. You can't use crates in there yet, but if you just want to see if it compiles um, or see the assembly that it'll output, go for it. So as I mentioned, we have different releases. There's a nightly release, and then there is beta and stable. And we've promised people that stable pretty much won't break on them. Um, when we released 1.0, the announcement, one of the, uh, the things in that blog post was that our responsibility is to ensure that you never have to dread upgrading Rust. So how does, how does this language and this ecosystem actually make people feel? You look for people's thoughts on it, and you start getting, as well as technical criticisms, a whole lot of information about the community. The not-so-secret weapon is the welcoming community. The Rust community seems to be populated entirely by human <laughs> beings. I have no idea how this was done. Well, I have been lucky enough to get a chance at getting the idea of how this was done, and that's what I'm here to share with you. So I personally, being a sysadmin, or the DevOps title for sysadmins who aren't afraid of code, um, think that a lot of the credit goes to the team's ability to automate. So I think of automation as you have the system with people and computers in it, and you offload some of the work that people are doing onto the computers. And you, you have a certain input, a certain stimulus, and you make sure the computers always give the same response instead of making a person do it. But you know what that really sounds like? That sounds like teaching the system a habit. And so I view extremely pervasive habits that you teach people as a form of automating the system of the community. So that is why I somewhat conflate those two terms throughout this talk. So the main thesis is that life is better. That does not say perfect. Life, uh, we still have some problems um, in the REST community, but there were a variety of problems that I really expected to see because I thought they existed everywhere that I haven't. And then I've kind of pried into why and I'll go through these. The first one is that people seem to usually really fight about stuff. People will come in with totally different ideas about what they should be doing, and then they'll be anywhere from confrontational to outright mean and hostile and try to get each other to leave if they disagree. And I've kind of asked, why, why does this happen? Why do people keep getting into conflicts? And the answer you find, if you keep asking why enough, is diversity. People have diverse viewpoints on what you should be doing, and that's basically the root cause of all disagreement. So how do you handle this so that you get the benefits of, of everybody's um, different viewpoints, different experiences, without getting into these horribly hostile fights? So in most communities, I'm used to the alternative being basically trial by verbal combat. You, <laughs> you find two different opinions, and then you yell at each other on some medium or another until somebody gives in, somebody leaves. Um, we have a tool that keeps out the people who insist on trial by verbal combat. It fits on one page, I'm sorry, the font is small. That's the tool. Um, and it's a code of conduct. It's a code of conduct that is carefully structured to specify exactly what behavior is unacceptable and exactly what actions will be taken in the event of unacceptable behavior, as well as spelling out the way that the moderation team works and how seriously they need to take their duties. And then we put that thing everywhere. You can't go onto a subreddit without it being right there at the top. You can't make your first post or two on any of our forums without a big reminder asking you to please be a nice person. You can't get into the IRC channels without being linked to it. So how does this make people feel? Most people feel pretty good about it. Some people say, the REST community gives me a particularly bad feeling. They're rather tyrannical about enforcing their code of conduct. They even have a moderation attack squad to go after anyone they deem an enemy. I've never seen this kind of orchestrated control exerted over the community of any other programming language. This sets off warning alarms for me. This is awesome. We have just <laughs> driven away the kind of person who would try to resolve their differences via a fight rather than via moderation. So um, 
I don't, I don't know quite who this was. They posted as anonymous coward on slash thought. Oh, well, I would give them credit if I could. <laughs> so there is one caution to this. Um, having a code of conduct does sort the people who want to work with moderation from the people who don't. And if you try to bring one into a community that has historically not had one, um, then that means that you're asking the people who aren't OK with resolving their differences in a formalized manner to get out. And that doesn't make people happy. So this has worked so well for Rust because everybody who's currently there either asked for the code of conduct or joined once it was instated, and so they were sorted by it um, automatically. So we've got a bunch of people who basically agree on that they're trying to build this cool language and that they're going to be civil to each other as they do it. So they want to build code, but what code should they build? How should they implement this language? In most communities, people just kind of guess. People go off and build a feature and pull request that feature, and then sometimes it's good. Other times it's not good. You can't merge it. It was done just inconsistently with the way that the code is supposed to be. So. Um, we also sometimes use pull requests welcome as a synonym for, I really don't want to explain why that's a terrible idea right now. I don't think it's possible anyway. Please go away. And this causes people to spend a lot of time on code that may not be at all appropriate for the project. And this is a highly scientific graph. Um, I have noticed that the more time someone spends on something, the worse it hurts to be told, no, we don't want that thing. You spend a little bit of time on it, you're like, ah, oh, all right, I'll do something else. You spend a bit of time, a bit more than that, you're kind of sad. And if you spend a whole bunch of time building something really nice, you actually get angry when you're told that nobody wants it. So to keep people from putting huge amounts of time into building things that we don't want, the REST community uses the request for comment process. Um, before building a major feature, you do an RFC. You explain what you want to build and how you want to build it. And then it goes through several comment periods, gets run by a core team to make sure that everybody's on the same page about what's getting built and why. And anybody with major objections has a chance to object before you've dumped hours and hours into the code itself. So in this big distributed community, it's kind of hard to keep track of what RFCs are going on, what's happening, what's come out recently, what features are new. And so the system that we use to solve that problem is a weekly newsletter that it'll have all that bookkeeping stuff. But um, the thing that I find most interesting about this is that we will also call out the new contributors, the people whose first commit into a Rustlang repo was during that past week. And that's a way of showing people that even small contribu uh, contributions are appreciated and encouraging them um, to continue on. So in addition to calling out new contributors, we'll sometimes give a little kind of an honor onto somebody who's gone above and beyond. Um, it's not every week that we, have, that we recognize a friend of the tree, but the very core um, language maintainers will talk about who's really been extra special about it, somebody who's taken on a really difficult task or been super consistent or clearly spent a bunch of hours triaging bugs that nobody else wanted to, to triage. Um, and that person will be named friend of the tree. Now, that seems kind of a weird way of using our words for somebody who's special to the language. Why are we so worried about the tree rather than like friend of rust or restation of the week or something? It's because the alternative is pretty terrible. When you let the tree break, it makes the language a worse experience for everybody. Anyone who tries to install and use a nightly is going to get somewhere between um, non-functional and potentially even hostile code. Um, the developers who are trying to work on a project in Rust and try to keep up to date with the latest things are going to have to roll back to an old nightly. The public image of the project gets worse because people have just had a bad experience with it. And everybody's confidence in the project decreases if you have broken code in the tree. So we solve this with a basically systemic belief in the community that um, Graydon, the guy who initially started Rust, um, quantified as the not rocket science rule of software engineering. If you only take one slide away from this talk, 
I want it to be this one. The not rocket science rule of software engineering says that you should automatically maintain a repository of code that always passes all the tests. This might sound obvious, this might sound impossible, but we have a pile of automation that does this for us. Um, so normally, when you try to keep your build green all the time, you've got somebody who's ask, acting as a gatekeeper and then a bunch of new contributors who are kind of having to fight them about whether their code should get in or not, um, about whether the tests are good enough, about what's going on. Um, and I'm totally accustomed to other communities where it's always maintainer versus newbie, maintainer versus contributor. And how does telling some really enthusiastic, passionate new contributor know all the time, day after day, week after week, make you feel? It's not great. So we have shifted this by automating the process so that it's not you versus me, it's us versus them. So who is this us? Who gets commits into the Rust tree? Um, this is a graph built by a little tool that, some uh, that a Rust contributor made in order to um, visualize the, the community a bit better. And so this one account seems to get a whole lot of code in. This, this guy, called, guy or maybe a lady called Bors gets far more code in than any other individual person. So let's, let's go look at the tree. That's, that's an interesting GitHub avatar. That name <laughs> rings a bell from somewhere. Bors is our robot. Bors is a sufficiently personified robot that it's not you're dumb for failing a test, it's Bors is a meanie. And I personally believe that that anthropomorphization helps people um, deal with that code review process and with the automated testing. So the way, the logic that Bors actually uses is he will, um, he will wait until the pull request has been reviewed to run the tests on it, and immediately after running the tests, he will merge it. Because traditional continuous integration testing says, okay, I've opened a pull request, I'll run the tests now, get the result before review, and then go through and review the code and make any changes and run the results, uh, run the tests after each change, maybe if you're lucky, and then um, eventually, it'll get merged and just go straight into master. Um, that's problematic because master will move on you between when the tests are run and when the PR merges. So Bors is actually the only individual who's allowed to merge things into a tree. Um, and he will check. He will first check, was it approved? Okay, cool, it was approved. Can it merge? If it can't merge, it bit rotted, you've got to go fix it. Is it approved and it can merge? Okay. Let's go test it, test exactly what master would look like with this um, PR applied. And if those tests pass, then and only then does the master branch of the repo get updated to the result of having merged that PR. So that keeps the tree green. Um, so there's a repo called Bors. That's not actually the Bors we use anymore because it was a stateless, um, a stateless bot that worked on a polling model on a cron job every like minute or so. That doesn't really scale so great, so a community member wrote an iterative improvement called HOMU. And HOMU keeps state, um, gets triggered by a GitHub hook because setting up Git hooks is relatively trivial um, these days. It supports a few extra features, like you can roll a bunch of commits together for testing if you've got, say, several documentation fixes, and you can try a build if you don't have the ability to run the full test suite locally, which can be a concern um, for contributors that don't have a particularly good system to run on since the, the suite, uh, test suite takes a couple hours. And just, just out of posterity and to make sure that everything is confusing, um, the account is named Bors. So you notice in, when we talk about Bors logic that we say look for BuildBot for test results. And using BuildBot has actually given us another interesting way of interacting with the community in that I'm used to somebody will say, oh, I want this platform supported, and then we'll have to say, no, no way do we have time to run one of those platforms along with everything else, nope. And then that person goes away feeling sad. Um, in the case of BuildBot, if we have a trusted community member who wants to support a given platform, then they can run a build slave for us, and 
if we trust them sufficiently, we can even upload the artifacts from that so that users of their distro or their platform will have those artifacts available. Of course, we have to be very clear about our communication about which artifacts are endorsed and which ones are community built, but this allows for a good example, the, free, uh, the BSD community to run three different build slaves that improve REST's BSD support on various flavors of it that wouldn't be available if the community had to only rely on the core team and what we have the bandwidth for. So things are going pretty good, right? We've automated the process of getting nice humans by literally scaring away the ones that don't play nice. Um, <laughs> we have shown them that they, we appreciate them in a variety of ways. and. We've kept them from having to really fight with each other to keep the tree green. So you get this awesome project, and it sounds really good. And what happens when you have a good project that people say good things about and that people are really interested in, you get a whole bunch of new contributors. So I'm used to when a project has an influx of new contributors, often it'll put more and more work on the core people who do most of the work, and then all the, all the newbies kind of start to look the same. It's like, wow, I've had to explain the basics of reading the contributing guide five times this week. Why are these new people so, why don't any of them read kind of thing? And that can be very frustrating. And in my own experiences, I found that that leads to burnout. So we automated it. Um, we have this bot called High Five. <laughs> She's cool. She's friendly. Um, and. What High Five does is creates a welcoming environment. So there are three features basically shown conveniently in the top, um, top few pieces of activity of High Five that we really care about. So High Five can welcome a newbie. If High Five sees that this is from an account that doesn't have a commit in that repo, she'll be like, hey, welcome. Here's the contributing guide. Here's a reviewer for you. For anybody, she'll assign a reviewer um, based on where in the code the commit touches, and then if you do something that doesn't look quite right, like if you're PR'd against a branch that's not the one we usually do, she can give you a warning, like that first comment up there. So the way that REST's high five works is you'll tell it per repo who's on what team, and then you'll tell it of the directories in that repo which team should be reviewing what. Because REST has become such a big project that someone who's a real expert on one area may not be the most qualified to review the other area, or another area. Um, unfortunately, so Servo is using a similar system with the same name, which has diverged somewhat. And that happens. They're both cool. Um, we're working on getting them closer back together. So you know what to do once the newbie gets their first PR in. But often, you'll have to deal with these people who are just like, what can I help with? Can I help? Can I help? What do I do? And that can take up a lot of bandwidth that could go to coding as well. So um, we're fortunate enough to have amazing, an amazing contributor, Josh Matthews, on the servo side of the research team who does um, an incredible amount of mentoring. And um, one of the things he's been involved with is the starters project. So we have one of these for Rust. The servo issues are triaged um, slightly better in a way that, um, that works with it. So I'm showing you the servo one as the example. And it'll go dig through the repos and find you unclaimed issues that have the tags you want. Um, and this is kind of an improvement over your usual issue aggregators because it's customized to the tags and customized to the logic of that particular project. So there's also one for Rust. I've found that they um, automations like this, the coolest thing is they tend to spread through the community. Once you see Homu working well on one repo, you ask for it to show up on others. Once you see High Five um, greeting people on one repo, people will just email me and go, hey, can I get fi High Five on this repo? Can I get High Five on that repo? And that tells me that it's created an automation that people want to use. Now, the final thing that I'll leave you with here is the idea of Crater. So the background to Crater is that um, a Rust package, like a Python package, will be in pip. A Rust library will be in a crate, and it will be in cargo. And we have the not rocket science rule. We say, let's automatically maintain code that, um, that always passes all the tests. But what if there aren't enough tests? What if you need to test the compiler as well? Because we've promised people a stable compiler. 
um, when we call it a stable release, it had better not make your life miserable if you upgrade it to it. So my colleague Brian Anderson has developed this wonderful tool that tests the compiler. Its name is Crater. And basically, it will run the old compiler and the new compiler on all of the REST code that we can get. So the crates.io index is a great um, aggregation of all of the REST code that we can find in the wild. And it will diff, it will basically diff the errors. If you get a new error, or if you had an error that goes away, then that means that we need to dig in and manually see what didn't get caught by a test and what changed between the old stable and this one. So basically, we are constantly working to automatically maintain that repository of code that always passes all the tests with a whole bunch of bots that also make life better for people. And um, questions? Mm. <laughs> Yay, we have questions. Um, I think there's a mic around here somewhere. Or I can repeat the question. Is it a question or a story? It's a tale of woe in the form of a question. OK. Tales of woe in the forms of questions are completely acceptable. Um, so I work with a project called FreeBSD. And we've been in the news a bit of late for failing some stuff. Um, so FreeBSD is a project of a certain age. And FreeBSD is a project with a lot of people who are unaware of the issues that, that, that then cause things like codes of conduct to come into things. I realize this is probably the worst possible question to ask, but how would you recommend retrofitting these ideas onto a project of a certain age like FreeBSD? So I do not know whether that's possible. I personally believe that it's working so well in Rust because of how early these things were added. And one of the ways that I've found that sometimes works for persuading self-aware individuals to change their behaviors is to start by finding a priority that they have. Like, if, especially if you have a particular group within the community that's really not pulling in the same direction as everybody else, you go, OK, what is the most important thing to you about this project? Maybe, let's say it's widespread acceptance, or let's say it's faster code or something. And then from that priority, if you can lead them backward into why adopting a code of conduct, and I say specifically that agreeing to resolve disputes in a formalized manner rather than through public fighting um, is the effect of the code of conduct that I'm talking about. Um, if you can lead them back to that conclusion, then they may go with it. And you may discover that there's a group that just has a priority that is not consistent with yours. And I've seen projects fork in that case. I mean, sometimes if you just, if you're like, we need, we need the friendliest project. Well, we need the best code, and who cares whose feelings get hurt? Or we need to, to rigorously only accept code that meets our standards immediately rather than helping it. Who cares whose feelings get hurt? You may, you may have irreconcilable differences. And just as a follow-on comment, I think the other one is that the FreeBSD community as a whole is probably less cohesive than the Rust community. The Rust community, but at least based on what, yeah. you've, what you're showing there. Yeah, we have a very clearly defined goal of, yeah. I mean, sure, we'll, we'll haggle about exactly how we should get to that goal all the time. Could you pass that downward, please? We've got a question down here. So most of the, the things around constructing such a community are geared towards a more sort of volunteer, casual basis. Mm -hmm. In a corporate environment, it is harder to fire someone's ass if you're not their manager than in a community thing where you just kill file the person and you're done. Um, is there any sort of experience there? And like it, in the Rust community, I gather a lot of people work for you know, Mozilla there. Um, so to not attract the epic assholery that can happen in I some mean, environments. I would say that um, I was actually hired into the team. I'm I, one of the most recent hires um, on the team at the moment. And they were, the, the interview process had a surprising amount of, do you grok open source? Can you deport yourself in a community without embarrassing us? Um, do, you, do you know the basics of this? Because we would 
um, because we, we really need somebody who's already leveled up on this in another environment at their current size. And so I think identifying those priorities um, when hiring, and then if you've got somebody who's a huge problem already in, I mean, there's books upon books about what to do with them, but and I'm my personal approach would be to try to find examples of where they are um, hindering the goals of their boss, and then um, discuss that in whatever format works best. Um, right behind you, we've got a question. So I don't have a question, but. Other communities that are of a similar age to um, FreeBSD is Debian, who has had a long-term trouble, this is what Gus was mentioning, had a long-term trouble with this, but is also trying to come back from that. But another uh, community of a similar sort of age is the Haskell programming language community, which um, doesn't have as much, hasn't done it the way Rust has done it, but it has, it has evolved over, I mean, the Haskell community started in the, the very early 90s and is mostly there already. Um, so it Depends. I would love to hear the talk equivalent to this on how Haskell does it. We've got one up there in the back. Is it short enough that you can just shout it at me and I'll repeat it? Where can I get the code? Where can you get the code? Um, I have dropped links through the slides. The slides are right there. Um, I will actually, how about I do a blog post of like all the links to all the things because the ones that I specifically called out are throughout the slides. Um, Oh, yeah, it, you mean the Rust code or the tools code? Tools. So the tools code is, so High Five currently lives at GitHub NRC High Five. Um, there's another High Five at Servo High Five. There's um, Homu, Homu proper is at GitHub B-I-R-O-S-L slash Homu. Um, there is a fork of Homu for more kind of bleeding edge changes um, within the Servo organization because Servo's priority is having um, having the changes fast, and Bar um, Barasol, as a maintainer, um, is really concerned about um, utmost code quality, so his review process will tend to be slower. So, um, who else did I talk about? Yeah, the code of conduct itself, of course, is rustlang.org slash conduct. That's not the code you were talking about, I know. But, um, <laughs> and then, yeah, the Rust code. There's all kinds of interesting things in the Rust repo, uh, the Rustlang repo. Yeah. Um, oh, and I need to, of course, advertise that we have organized a Rust language birds of a feather session downstairs um, during afternoon tea, which will be coming up next. Is that all? No more hands. Um, cool. Then we can talk later. Okay. Thank you so much, Emily.